Good morning, Christians. What a blessing it is to gather on this beautiful day. We look at the front of the church and things look a little different because today we enter a brand new church here. This is the first Sunday of Advent. But there's more than the color change. There's water in the altar reminding us that we have a joyful occasion today as we celebrate the rebirth of our friend Bentley, a newborn child of God, and we celebrate with your family today. God bless your worship this morning at Shepherd of the Hills. Our service is printed in our service program, and we begin with a reminder of our own baptism and that, what that means for us in our daily life. You'll find that responsive reading on page three at the bottom. We'll remain seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity but I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. My dear friends, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water 
through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Without further ado, we invite the family of Bentley to the baptism font. Our Lord says in the gospel according to St. Mark, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. Bentley Robert McKamey. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll wipe that off. Receive the cross upon your head and upon your heart to mark you as a redeemed child of God through Christ the crucified. The Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has given you new birth of water and the Spirit and has forgiven all your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Let us pray together. We give thanks, most merciful God, that you have received Bentley as your own child and made him a member of Christ's body, the church. Now we pray that you grant him and all your church on earth that being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness and being buried with Christ into his death, we may share in his resurrection so that with all believers, we may inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is for you. And I'm going to give you your certificates to the sponsors as well. Christopher and Jennifer, this is for you. A momentum of this occasion. Thank you. And these are for you. God bless you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We as a congregation will rise and we will respond to this precious gift from our Lord and Savior with the hymn on the top of page six, as we marvel at what just took place with simple water and the promises of God, it's entitled, See This Wonder in the Making.
pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sin. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. Our first lesson for this first Sunday of a brand new year of God's grace, recorded in the epistle, Paul's inspired word to the Philippians of the fourth chapter, beginning at verse four. There we hear, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Alleluia. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Alleluia. is printed for us on page 8. It is entitled, Let the Lord Enter. We'll sing it together in unison. to rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. The appointed gospel for the first Sunday in the season of Advent 
and he gives us a look ahead. Advent is about the coming of Jesus. So we prepare for his coming at Christmas, but we also prepare for his coming at the end of time. Here, we jump right in to Holy Week, and we see Jesus coming in a parade, unlike the parade we celebrated yesterday, a parade that leads to execution, to his sacrificial death for our life. We read from Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at the first verse. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you. You are to say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on them. A very large, large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road. The crowd who went in front of him and those who followed him kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. At this time, normally we invite the young children up to the front for the children's church. Hi, Mr. Marcus. We just have one today. Well, we're blessed to have you here. Marcus, do you like a parade? Have you been to a parade? Well, you're a little young. You might not remember your last parade. But last night we had a parade. And there were kids your age all over. And they were saying, Merry Christmas. And they had their hands out. They were looking for candy canes. And they gave them candy canes. And everybody was having a great time. And there were lights. And there was music. It was a wonderful parade. Well, in the Bible, we're, we're told about a parade too. And Jesus was in it. And there were kids who sang, right, and celebrated. And there was no candy, not that I know of. But this was a different sort of parade. This was a parade, and not celebrating the season. This was a parade that was leading to a hill outside Jerusalem where Jesus would die on one of those. Why would Jesus do that? The answer is real simple. His love for you, and his love for you, and his love for you. Jesus marched into Jerusalem in the midst of a parade and celebration and the voices of children to lay down his life to take away all our sins. And the Bible says if Jesus paid for our sins, where do you think they went? They're gone. Yeah, so when God looks at you, he just sees Jesus' perfect record. And do you think he frowns? No. Do you think he's mad? Yes. No, he's happy. And he loves you, and he can't keep his eyes off of you. That's how much he loves you. That's tremendous news, and that's why we celebrate today. We celebrate Bentley's baptism today, because Bentley has that too, just like you. So, if you're off to Children's Church today, may God bless you and remind you of that love that is yours every single day. Can we pray real quick? Thank you, Jesus, for marching into Jerusalem to die. You did that for me, and you will always love me. You take all my sins away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. The rest of us will continue with our hymn of the day. It is entitled, Lift Up Your Heads, You Mighty Gates, Hymn 306.
meditation this first Sunday of Advent takes us to the Old Testament book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 2. Abel tended sheep, but Cain worked the ground. As time passed, one day Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of his soil. Abel also brought some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord looked favorably on Abel and his offering, but did not look favorably on Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry, and his face showed it. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why do you have that angry look on your face? If you do good, will you not be lifted up? If you do not do good, sin is crouching at the door. It has a strong desire for you but you must rule over it. Cain said to Abel, his brother, let's go into the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked Abel, his brother, and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the soil. Now, You are cursed and sent away from the soil, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the soil, it will no longer give its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. Look today, you have driven me away from the soil. I will be hidden from your face, and I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, no. If anyone kills Cain, he will face sevenfold revenge. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that anyone who found him would not strike him down. This is the word of our God. Sarah Connor, if you want to live, follow me. Anyone remember that? It's a quote from a movie. Terminator, that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, it goes back a spell. But it has application for us today because today, the first Sunday of Advent, we are taking a look at what it will take to prepare ourselves for Christ's coming at Christmas, of course, and Christ's return at the end of time. We want to be prepared. And part of being prepared is having a heart of repentance. And having a heart of repentance is recognizing what is wrong with us. What is wrong with the world will be our series for the season of Advent as we meditate upon the Word of God and we go to Genesis first. What is wrong with us? Look at your news feed lately. Television news. Newspaper. Atrocities in our communities. Mass shootings. Yet again. Confusion frustration, anger, envy, violence, all around us in our world. Atrocities at home, atrocities overseas, murder, and worse. Goes all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? And maybe the real question is not so much what is wrong with the world out there, but is what is wrong with me. I'm sure the first Sunday of Advent a year ago saw me stand before you, stand right here, and in the back of my mind, you don't see it, I have a list of all those things in my life that need work, need attention, need to be addressed, and that list, I am almost certain, is longer this year than it was last year. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with you? God says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. So we're going to take a moment on this first Sunday of a new church here as we prepare our hearts for Christ's coming. And we're going to focus and meditate upon the power of sin and the subtleness of sin. But then, as we always do, We're going to go back to the victory over sin. So first, sin has power. 
it is described as crouching at the door. That particular description is from a verb form that is reserved in describing lions and tigers. And even if you have no experience with those big cats, you might have a cat at home. And we had a cat at home for many years, and that cat was interesting. It was taken care of. It was, quote-unquote, domesticated, except when it wasn't, except when it was looking for birds to kill in the backyard. had no interest in mice, but was after the birds. And you would see Smokey, kind of a bigger cat. She would make herself really small, and she would crouch down. And her tail would gently twitch. And she would be there for sometimes hours, making the birds feel very comfortable with her presence. And while the birds were aware of her, she was some distance off and such a small little cat, no threat at all until she pounced. Same description used for the relationship to sin in our very life. It seems so small, hardly anything to be concerned with at all. I got my eye on it. It's a distance away when, boom, it's all over. Sin, Scripture says, desires to have you. The thing most likely to take you and me down seems small, kind of cute sometimes, insignificant, and certainly under control in our lives. The most Dangerous sins in your life, in my life, are the sins we deny, the sins that we justify, the sins that we excuse, the sins that we say aren't really a very big deal at all, those sins that we get rather annoyed when other people bring them up to us. It's just sleeping, it's not a threat. Not a problem. Sin is like a virus in your body. I spoke with a medical professional one particular time because one of my kids had a rather stubborn infection that turned out to be MRSA. And of course, as a parent, you're concerned. This is a particular type of virus that is, or bacteria rather, that is immune to antibiotics. And that medical professional, that doctor, said probably 90% of the people in the medical community have MRSA because of their exposure to patients, but it remains more or less dormant. It is within your body, but your immune system can keep it under control until it can't. So you get worn down, you get sick, or you suffer from another disease of one type or another, your body is hard at work for alarm fire and the MRSA strikes, it takes over. Sin is like that in our lives. It seems like we have it under control. It doesn't really seem to be showing itself in our life until it does because you don't do sin. Sin does you. Sin is like a virus on your hard drive, on your particular computer. It might be on there. You don't really notice it. After a while, the computer gets a little quirky, but no big deal. And then one day, it won't turn on at all. It makes weird sounds, and it's down for the count. Those little ones, they look like kitty cats. Not a big deal. Those are the ones that are crouching and desire to have you. Sin is like driving through Chicago, and I pray all of you are spared with driving through Chicago for the rest of your earthly lives, but there are expressways and a lot of them. God have mercy on you if somebody has to go to the bathroom. Because if you get off of, you're not getting back on again. Right? It's not like a regular ramp where you turn around and find the ramp and get back on the expressway again. Once you're off, you're off. Sin is like that in our lives. How does it work? Well, you know, it's just a little rattle. It's just uh, uh, a little murmur. You know, we all do it, right? Just a 
tiny bit of bitterness, just Oh, he kind of going off on this a little bit. I mean, who doesn't do that? But that little grumble, it turns into a rattle. And that little rattle seeks to take you down. Uh, a little bit of greed. You know, we live in a society that really focuses on capitalism and making money and that is good I wouldn't change that at all it's how things run in our world but you volunteer for the Lions Club and of course nobody wants to keep the books right everybody hates that job but you're a pretty small person you're pretty good with math and spread sheets so you you're the bookkeeper and once you're on it's kind of like being on the board at Shepherd the Hills you're on forever I shouldn't say that that's not true especially if you're a treasurer. And you start justifying yourself, like nobody wants to do this job. This is hours and hours of unpaid work, so you take uh, just a, a little liberty, right? And you know, the, the, the charity can float you a little bit of money when things are down, and you're going to pay it back someday, and afterwards, you know, look, nobody wants this job. You work hard. You're entitled to a little bit of it. It grows and it twists itself into something bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, there are a whole series of events in the paper at one particular time. I can't recall a year or so ago when, you know, every Girl Scout troop and every Lions Club and every um, type of organization or soccer club or mom's group was discovering that people were embezzling literally millions of dollars from their bank accounts and it starts just with a little... A little grumble, a little murmur, it's all under control. A little lust. God made the opposite track, sex attractive to us. A little lust, it, it's not going to hurt you, it's not going to cause any problem. Nobody's going to know about it until they do. Until you find yourselves doing things you could never expect or dream that you would do. And it rolls you. It's those little things like the cat crouching in the corner that will bring you down. A little bit of pride. A little bit of pride says, I deserve this. I deserve the affection. I deserve the attention. I deserve a reward for all the work I do for everyone else. And that gets ugly real quick. Or real slowly. But one way or another, that sin does you. Galatians tells us in chapter 6, your sins will find you. What infection, it seems benign, it seems harmless, is coursing through your blood vessels right now. It seems under control. What cats are crouching in the corner of your room, keeping an eye on you? What's really not a big deal, and you think you got a handle on it in the season of Advent? That's what we look at. We get that cat out of there. We get the help that we need to take that cat where that cat belongs and put it in the backyard where it no longer is desiring to take you down. So how do we do it? Well, we have to recognize, first of all, that sin is extremely subtle. Back to our account of Cain and Abel. They brought offerings to the Lord. Why did they bring offerings to the Lord? Because they wanted to show their love for God. And we somehow imagine, at least I do, from Sunday school lessons about this from long ago, that Abel brought his offering to the Lord and God gave it a big thumbs up. Oh, that's just awesome. That's great stuff. And then Cain comes with kind of a sloppy offering that doesn't really look that great. And God says, eh, you're out of here. No, this is not a sin offering. This is a, a gift offering. It's like uh, buying a ring for your beloved, right? It's expensive, but it's supposed to flow from a heart that loves. It's a 
commitment. It is a saying to God, you love me and I love you too and I'm bringing my best to you to show to you my devotion and love and thanksgiving for everything I have in my life. Two offerings. To us they would have both looked equal. We couldn't have judged which one was better. God's not saying I hate vegetables and grain. I love meat. No, God's not doing that. But God is the God that looks into our heart and sees the motivations of the heart. And here we see an able sacrifice, a man that understood that his salvation is from God and loved God and wanted to bring God the best. And here is another man, Cain, who's a little half-hearted and kind of figures, well, if I bring a nice offering to God, I'll be okay with him. It is not the offering at all that God has a problem with. It's the motivation behind the offering because sin is subtle. It hides. This is a bit terrifying to me because I have to ask myself, am I half-hearted in my love for the God who loves me? It seems like a mundane thing. It doesn't seem that is serious that my intentions never perfect my devotion never total we're all a bit like Cain we're all a bit half-hearted we want to give God our best but at times we're like oh, you know things are kind of tight this month what happens to Cain Cain is in some way we're not told alerted of the reality that his offering was not accepted by God. And what did it do? It made him bitter and resentful and angry and jealous. And oh, just the mention of the word Abel would have driven him up the wall until it filled his hearts with violence, ultimately inviting his brother out for a walk in the field where he murders his brother in cold A little half-heartedness led to that. Not only that, but exile from his family and exile from God for eternity. Sin always looks smaller than it is. What little things, my friend? What little things in your life and mine? A little grudge, a little rattle, a little murmur, a little mutter, a little envy, a little self-pity, a little selfishness, that wee bit of pride. What's that doing to you right now? It's just waiting to overcome you, and it's waiting to pounce upon you, and it's waiting to take you down. And you're saying, Pastor, this is a very sad and somewhat upsetting sermon. Well, wait, we'll get to it. What does the Lord say? You can master it. How do we master it? By discipline. I'll tell you, I try to be disciplined in my life. That's not going to do it. There is another solution. The ultimate Abel, born of the Virgin Mary, came to this earth. And we, Cain's, did what? We pounced on him, of course. We couldn't take him any longer. And we nailed him to the cross and the blood, his innocent blood, dripped down his body off, his hands off, his feet and was absorbed by the ground in the Middle East, outside Jerusalem. And that blood cried out too. What does it cry out? Vengeance? Nope. It cries out justice. For that one, the Holy One, true God and true man, became the sin bearer, bore our sin, took our curse, faced God's wrath, breathed his last, cried out it is finished and rose again so that that blood cries out justice from the ground and justice is a good thing in your case and mine. I'll tell you why. In 1 John chapter 1 these words are written. Listen to them. If we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins he God is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean that God is faithful and just? It means that if Christ on that cross, outside that hill in Jerusalem, died for all the murmurs and the rattles and the greed and the half-heartedness of you and me once for all, then you can't be charged a second time because God is just. He was condemned in your place once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now your record, as we said to those kids, perfect, spotless. He is just. Your sins are forgiven. He paid your debt in full. You are a child of God like Bentley. You are, Bentley wasn't even aware really what happened today. But God in his grace saved him. So often I'm not aware of the issues that crouch within my lives, but God has saved me. God has saved you. Your sins are gone forever, separated from God as far as the east is from the west. Now there is a store somewhere around here. I've never been to it. The Good Feet store. Have you ever heard of that? Some of you? Okay. I imagine, I haven't been there. The concept is I have bad feet or sore feet. I walk in and they They fix up my feet, and my feet are good. After that, you pay him some money. This is not that place. I mean, I don't want to look at your feet. Sorry. This I will say. This is not the good feet store. This is the good conscience store. Because when you come here and here, yes, we are alerted, and yes, we're made to feel a little uncomfortable by God's holy law and its judgment over us, but that law always leads us to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the one who died and has risen and has taken your sins away. God is faithful, yes, but he's just. Your sins are gone. Your conscience clear before a holy God. You are made right, not by your life, by what he has done for you. Now, as we prepare for his coming, and his coming again, As we look at our lives and examine those things crouching in the corners, let us do away with them. Let us prepare our hearts for his coming. Let us recognize the threat that they are to our lives. And let us, among ourselves and at the feet of the cross, leave those behind. That we might have that good conscience towards God from him, not from us, and be filled with peace and joy this week and always as we prepare to celebrate and welcome the Lord in Bethlehem and the Lord when he returns. On that day, what will you say? You will stand before the holy God of the universe. It will be judgment day. This is what you say. I got nothing. I'm a sinner. You're my righteousness. You paid my debt. Not only are you faithful, but you are just, and my sins are forgiven. And he will say, welcome into my arms for eternity. God grant that to you, to me, to Bentley. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now the peace of God that transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in him until life everlasting. At this time we continue as we meditate and let the grace of God roll over our hearts with our musical offering. We ask our guests to please sign, all our people to please sign the guest book.
Lord, you love us infinitely. Your love is from everlasting to everlasting. We love you. Accept these gifts and use them to your glory, your glory in reaching those who do not know your love. God grant it for your name's sake. Amen. At this time we join in confessing our faith, the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us rise. Those words are found on page 11 in our service program. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ. We hear today that just like in the case of Cain, the Terminator is out for us. But you call to us. If you want to live, follow me. You lead us here. Here we're reminded that we belong in your presence because we, just like Bentley, have been baptized into the family of God. Here we see the cross and the altar reminding us that you laid down your life for the sins of the world, that you are the Lamb of God, and that you have removed our guilt and shame from us forever, that you adorn us and robe us in your righteousness, that we are yours, and the day is coming when we will be gathered with the saints and believers from every era and worship you in worthiness and truth and joy beyond words. Lord, as we prepare ourselves for your coming, we ask you to come. Come and cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people through the long night of waiting and watching. Come and restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty earthbound goals and direct our eyes above from where you will come soon to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and genuine sorrow over our sins. Forgive us for the shameful ways that we have dishonored you and the shabby way we have dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others, just as we see you giving yourself to us. Come also and rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit the busyness and the distractions of this life and this time rob us of the peace that you give or deprive us of times to ponder and to be amazed at the gift that is truly ours. Set our hearts apart from the troubles and bustles and jostles of these days. Fill us with a quiet delight in finding you in a manger and keep hearts and minds undisturbed and focused upon your delight in us. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow at this time of year, for those undergoing spiritual trial, for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming and your love and your favor. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Hear us, Lord, as we bring to you this day our private petitions. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch. Of course, in you we put our hope. You who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on Bentley and all your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth, protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be seated. Our closing hymn for our worship today is Rejoice, the Lord is King, if you're so moved. Before we sing the final stanza, we'll rise and greet one another thereafter. Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn 524. <laughs>